even if negotiations are suspended at a mediation, there is still a role for the neutral, the guided choice mediator to play on an ongoing basis if the parties decide that they need to retreat uh, into litigation or arbitration for any particular reason. You know, one of the things that my mentor, Paul Lurie, taught me is that as long as the mediator continues to have the party's trust, there's seldom a good reason why the mediator should not uh, continue in a settlement facilitation role, even if the parties uh, are still at impasse after a traditional mediation day. And, you know, this is not the same thing as saying that, you know, after the parties are prematurely convened together in a traditional negotiation and it fails, you know, after a mediation event that the neutral should just do shuttle diplomacy for another week or two before declaring that the mediation failed. Um, you know, there is an ongoing role for the guided choice neutral. If negotiations are suspended and the parties go into litigation or arbitration, potentially, you know, months and months down the road. Um, you know, and I think it's important to remember that, you know, mediators, including those who are using any aspect of the guided choice dispute resolution process, all that they have are their own power of persuasion, right? Just because you agree to mediate, uh, there's nothing that prevents the parties from retreating into their default dispute resolution processes and, and joining or resuming the battle at any time, right? Um, and, and this can be, you know, litigation or arbitration. And sometimes, uh, you know, a successful mediation, uh, it, it's not linear, right? Sometimes the settlement process isn't linear. It's not always the case that we mediate and it either succeeds or fails. Uh, and if it fails, then we have to arbitrate or litigate. Um, you know, it is sometimes the case that of fruitful negotiations that result in a negotiated settlement do require the suspension of negotiations and either the initiation or the resumption of arbitration or court proceedings. Um, and this is when the guided choice neutral can have not just a useful role, but a particularly useful role. And it's one that doesn't necessarily even need to generate a lot of expense or delay to the parties, which you know can sometimes be an objection to the continued role of the neutral. And, and something that uh, has really been driven home to me is that the, the, the ongoing availability of the guided choice neutral alone, even the idea in the back of the party's heads that there is a channel of communicator that isn't the lawyer picking up the phone and talking to the other lawyer or you know saying something in front of the judge, even the guided choice neutral's ongoing availability in the background can be a useful reminder to the parties that a wide variety of communication channels um, are open and you know, could be exploited for purposes of considering whether a dispute is ripe for settlement at some point further down the road, maybe even after you know, a traditional mediation event uh, has failed. Um, you know, and this ongoing involvement of the guided choice neutral um, can, can be extremely helpful in subsequent discussions between the parties regarding arbitration or litigation issues that they might not be comfortable discussing openly in front of the arbitrators or the judge, or that the judge or arbitrators might not be comfortable discussing with the disputing parties. Um, you know, I'll give you one example. You know, in this age uh, of electronically stored information, you know, ESI, where all of the evidence that tends to <laughs> resolve these design and construction disputes or emails and text messages and Excel files, there can really be disproportionate expenses that are involved in electronically stored information, you know, exchange and discovery. And it may be the case that, uh, you know, the parties for whatever reason had to go into litigation because they weren't able to get the information that they need from the other party, uh, you know, voluntarily. And, um, you know, they really just need one little bit of information, you know, they just, need the job cost report of the other party, you know, or something that the party doesn't want to hand over the, the, the party on the other side, uh, you know, unless the judge, at, you know, the federal judge at the beginning of the process when they're crafting, you know, what are the protocols for electronic discovery, uh, you know, require a, a complete exchange of information that might be just outside the budget of the party that needs the job cost report, you know, or whatever other targeted information you know, that there may be. And so, you know, you may have a party that says, hey, I want to negotiate a settlement. I just need one document. 
I can't get it voluntarily from the other party. I can't get it through mediation. And so I resort to litigation, but now I'm hearing from a judge that I either can't get it or I can only get it as part of, you know, uh, a turning over of <laughs> the electronically stored information of so many custodians uh, of ESI from so many repositories that it's going to cost a million dollars uh, and I'm not even, <laughs> and that is going to make me realize that I can't even proceed into litigation on the merits. You know, it's just this one tidbit of information that maybe, you know, uh, it would be helpful for somebody to convey to the judge, you know, and this, this might not be something that the judge would be, you know, comfortable hearing, certainly not in any sort of a, um, you know, one party only, uh, you know, exchange of information, right? You have to say what you need to say in, in uh, view of all the disputing uh, parties' attorneys, uh, you know, and uh, it, it's something that it may not be possible for strategic or, or tactical reasons that a party can bring up, you know, in a filing. And so, you know, it's possible for the guided choice neutral, you know, to synthesize, you know, points of dissatisfaction between the parties, you know, including, you know, mutual points of dissatisfaction, you know, um, you know, and raise them directly with the tribunal, the arbitrator, the judges, uh, you know, without necessarily the tribunal even knowing, you know, which party the complaint may have originated from, you know, I mean, there may be one party or both parties, you know, just by way of another example, has a perception of an inattention to a key issue, uh, substantive or procedural on the part of the arbitrator, or the judge, and, you know, of course, there are ethics rules here and, you know, you um, mediators, including the neutrals that do the guided choice, choice process, tend to be very experienced design and construction lawyers that are not going to go step on, you know, any, um, you know, ethical prohibition. But there are ways where the ongoing involvement of the guided choice facilitator can be really helpful as a means of facilitating communications, the flow of information, not just between the parties, which can be very important, but you know, um, you know, perhaps, you know, with tribunals who may not be comfortable hearing information that the disputing parties may not be comfortable sharing, you know, with the tribunal, because it's certainly been my experience that many judges or arbitrators are reluctant to become involved in settlement negotiations, uh, you know, or to warn the parties uh, what might be obvious to the uh, tribunal, right, that, that they may be headed for, you know, uh, an unanticipated bad outcome uh, that both parties are not going to be happy with, you know, maybe a pyrrhic victory. You know, if the judge believes that, you know, if one party thinks that this is the outcome of the dispute and another party thinks that this is the outcome and the judge is like, well, it's actually right in the middle uh, and the parties are going to spend a lot of money beating each other up in scorched earth, uh, you know, motion practice and discovery only to find that they're not going to get anything other than having the baby split. Um, you know, which I don't mean to suggest in a pejorative way, but I mean, sometimes it's the case that a judge or an arbitrator will rightfully, after considering all the evidence, find that neither party's right and there it is somewhere in the middle. You know, many arbitrators or judges are reluctant to become involved in warning the parties that they're headed for a bad outcome or a period victory. And, you know, but they may be more comfortable expressing their concerns, of course, in the right setting, taking into account ethical prohibitions and what information can be shared, uh, you know, with judges and arbitrators and, you know, where is confidentiality, you know, and these are, I'm going to assume that anyone that would be selected by parties who have a serious design or construction dispute in a commercial project, that neutral is going to understand these things uh, and it's not going to step on an ethical prohibition. You know, the arbitrator, the judge, the tribunal may be more comfortable hearing, in a, you know, from a guided choice neutral or a mediator and expressing their concerns to the neutral, you know, on a semi-confidential basis, you know, you know, and have the neutral exhort the parties to settle because they're, you know, cruising, uh, you know, off the cliff together towards a period of victory. And so, you know, the facilitator, the, the guided choice neutrals ongoing presence allows the parties or even arbitrators or judges, the possibility of having lines of communication that remain open, you know, for the parties to reach out and explore new settlement possibilities that may open up after the pleading stage or after the fact discovery stage or after expert depositions are taken or whenever an off ramp is presented, you know, at some point before most uh, cases that are litigated go to bench trial or jury trial, you know, the statistics are clear. Most of them result in a voluntary settlement. 
And there is something that happens at some point along the path that makes the parties realize that something changed. I know I reject settlement in, in mediation, but now I've got more information and they might be looking for that off ramp. Well, you know, the off ramp to the litigation that would allow them to begin to resume again, the settlement negotiations, perhaps possessed with more information that would allow the business decision makers to make a strategic determination about the fact that it is now in their interest to settle the case. And so this ongoing availability, this open line of communication that the uh, guided choice neutral can have, not just in a little bit of shuttle diplomacy in the weeks after a, a traditional mediation event fails, but potentially for months and maybe even years uh, as binding dispute resolution plays out, um, you know, is potentially very useful, uh, you know, and I think that it's, there's a way to do this. If you have an experienced mediator uh, that would allow the parties to get the benefit without compromising the, qual the quality or the enforceability uh, of the, you know, outcome of the litigation or, you know, the outcome of the arbitration proceedings due to some sort of an ethical violation. So, you know, why is an ongoing role for the neutral even after negotiations are suspended at a traditional mediation event, essential to guided choice dispute resolution. Well, to me, this is the blinding flash of the obvious, but there's no, there's no downside. <laughs> there's almost nothing bad that can happen to have the neutral provided that he or she continues to have the party's trust. There's seldom a good reason why the mediator should not continue to have uh, a role in attempting to facilitate a, a, a negotiated resolution of the dispute, even if the parties are forced to retreat into their default binding dispute resolution methods like litigation or arbitration, to me, it's all upside for the parties and their counsel and for everyone involved.